Many people are worried that the US is going into recession and in fact the UK as well. So how can we position our portfolios to be protected from that kind of economic storm? And secondly, how likely is a recession in the first place? And the Fed's just published a really interesting model which suggests that that probability is higher than we might have thought. So we'll dig into that too. So let's look at the probability of recession, also how to protect our portfolios and how to invest during a recession in a bit more detail. So why do we care about recessions anyway? Well, the simple reason is that it affects the returns of things in which we invest. So beside me here, you can see two bar plots. Now, it's important to understand how to read these. All of the scatter of points that you can see is one monthly return for every month since 1999. And this is for the S&P 500. And what I've done is to split it into months during which the US is in recession, so that's in pink here, and months in which the US is not in recession, so that's in green. A simple way to remember that is that green is for growth. Now what the bar plot does, if I take the points away, is to summarize that distribution of returns. Sometimes the return will be positive, so you can see we've got some returns here which are almost 15% on a monthly basis, and sometimes the returns are as low as minus 10% in a single month. Now notice how during a period of recession there are less data points because most of the time the US isn't in a recession, but notice also that the tail at the bottom for large negative returns is bigger. We have more extreme negative outcomes during a recession for your equity portfolio than during a non-recessionary period. The key thing to look at is the typical return as well, because that's the horizontal black line inside the shaded box. That's the median return. But another thing to consider is, of course, those tails, particularly the downside tail, because in a recession that tends to be bigger and can result in a big loss for your portfolio. Now, of course, you might expect that the US equity market would be negatively impacted by a US recession. But what about the rest of the world or other asset types? Well, it turns out that if you do that analysis, and I've done the same shading here, but for multiple asset types and multiple indices, so I've got gold here on the far left, Chinese equity, so that's the Shanghai Stock Exchange Composite Index, I've got the FTSE 250 in the UK, the Nikkei 225 in Japan, the S&P 500 again, but also the German DAX, the French CAC 40, the Hong Kong Hang Seng Index, and oil. And notice that the median return is different, significantly different, for all of these indices. So that's why US growth is so important for the rest of the world. When the US enters recession, it can drag down all risky assets across the world. Now what I've actually done is to rank all of these indices according to how big the difference is between recessionary and non-recessionary returns. So I look at the median return during a recession and during a non-recession, and they're sorted by the size of that difference. So we can draw a clear line amongst these different assets, where the only asset that does better during a recession is gold. Notice that the median, which is pink, that's a typical return during a recession for gold, is higher than it is during a non-recessionary period, although the difference isn't huge. But the key thing is that the typical return for gold during a recession is positive. This median line is above the dashed red line, which is the zero return line. Now, we already saw that the US S&P 500 index has better returns during a non-recessionary period, during periods of growth, than it does during a recession. But what's surprising is that countries like Germany, France, Chinese equity in Hong Kong, and assets like oil are even more affected by US recession than the S&P 500 itself. And in fact, oil is the most affected asset type amongst all of these indices. So during a recession, oil prices tend to fall. And that's because there's less demand for gasoline, but also other fuel products, and that pushes down its price. The US is a big consumer of oil. And if we look at single exchange traded funds and look across different asset types, you can see that broadly the pattern is very similar. So the safe haven assets, such as UK gilts, 
And that's what IGLT, the iShares Core UK Gilts USIT ETF, buys. That also has a typical return which is greater during US recessions, albeit slightly. And it's also positive, which is a key thing to preserve your capital. But then as we look across the risky assets, such as UK corporate bonds, which are denominated in sterling, European equity, so IMEU tracks the MSCI Europe index, but also the FTSE 100 index tracker, and the Eurostox tracker and the US S&P 500 tracker. All of those, to an increasing degree, have large negative returns typically during a recession and positive returns during a period of growth. Now, if we plot those returns turned sideways so that large positive returns are on the right and large negative returns are on the left, what you can see here with these shaded regions are the return distributions but this time plotted as a density function. So here you can see that when we've got a green shaded region, that's a growth period for the US, the Dow Jones Eurostox index typically has a positive return. Most of the return distribution is positive, you can see that. Although there still is a large negative tail, which is typical for equity. But notice that when the return distribution is pink, that's during a US recession, the left-hand tail becomes much longer. And that's because you get more large negative returns for European equity during a US recession. Note also that the upside tail is actually truncated, so you don't get such good positive returns during those US recessions. Contrast that with a safe haven asset like UK gilts, and you can see that even during a recession, the distribution is kind of pushed to the right into positive territory. And that's because it's a safe haven asset. Of course, not all returns are positive. You can see that there's some probability distribution which is negative, but critically, there isn't a big negative tail. And that's why it's a safe haven, even during a recession. So the key understanding here is that when you buy an asset, what you're really buying is a return distribution. And what you want is an asset where that return distribution is mostly positive during a recession, because that'll provide you with protection. Given the sell-off that we've seen in government bonds at the beginning of 2022, could we still think of them as a safe haven? Now, long-duration US Treasuries have had their biggest single-year drawdown ever in 2022. They've fallen by around 20% or even more. And you can see why immediately if you look at this red line, which is the US 30-year yield. When the yield increases, the price of bonds falls. And when you have very long-duration bonds, the price falls by a multiplier which is very large, and that's the duration of the fund. And what you can see in 2022, which is just this tiny bit at the end of the graph, is that the yield increased very rapidly. So that's what made TLT sell off by 20%. So how could we possibly think about government bonds as being safe in this kind of environment? Well, the fact is that they're not safe. They certainly have high volatility if you go for long duration. Short duration, on the other hand, has lost a lot less. So if you look at one-year treasuries, there the sell-off has been less than 5% for a fund like SHY, for example. And that's despite the fact yields have increased so much. You can see they've increased by more in absolute terms than they have for US 30-year yield. But the duration there is so much shorter that the multiplier is tiny. So the actual sell-off has been much smaller. Now, the thing to remember is that the long end of the curve, that's the red line, is driven by growth expectations and inflation expectations, both of which have surged at the beginning of this year. But the question now is, are we going to see growth expectations continue to rise or inflation expectations continue to rise? If growth is going to disappoint or inflation might even start coming down or both, then Yields will come down on the long end of the curve and the bonds will rally. So you might be thinking that can't possibly happen given where inflation is right now. Well, if we look back to the Volcker period, you can actually see the recessions here shaded in blue. Notice how during a recession, there were periods when the yields fell very sharply on the long end of the US curve and the short end, because that's what typically happens during a US recession yields fall. And that's true even if inflation is very high, as it was at the end of 1981 and 82 during that recession. Then it happened again in 1991. Inflation was still quite high by today's terms, but notice how the 30-year yield fell, as did the one-year yield. So I wouldn't write off government bonds as a safe haven investment during a recession. 
Typically what happens is that yields do fall, even if inflation is high. But of course they still come with a risk. If yields do spike upwards, then if you have long duration, you could make a significant loss. So now that we've got a feeling about how asset returns vary during a recession and non-recessionary periods, are we going to get a US recession in the first place? The problem with US recessions is you don't usually find out they've happened until afterwards. And that's because there's a committee, the NBER committee, which decides where these blue shaded regions occur. And they usually do that after the fact. So in this top panel, you can see US GDP. Usually you get a recession when there are a couple of quarters of weak or even negative growth. But ultimately, whether that's a recession or not will be decided by that committee. So all we can really say at the moment is that the latest number for US GDP was growth of 3.5%. And that was for the first quarter of 2022. Fortunately, there is a more timely measure which is published every month, and that's US unemployment. And that gives a very good indicator of whether the US is in recession. So that's the proportion of people who are seeking work who don't have a job currently, but who are eligible to work. Notice how during a recession, it increases very rapidly. And this is how Claudia Sam came up with her Sam rule, because what that looks at is the rate of increase of the unemployment rate. And when it increases really rapidly, you can be almost certain that you're in a US recession. So what is that telling us right now? Well, the latest unemployment numbers were extremely low, 3.6%. And you can see that that's a multi-decade low. It's a little bit higher than it was before the pandemic recession, but not by much. So while that remains the case, it's quite unlikely that we'll enter a recession. However, what we do have to remember is that the Fed's policy action at the moment is to increase unemployment, or at least make a labour market which isn't so favourable to people who are employees. We'd say that the labour market right now is very tight, and the Fed wants to stop that because it wants to bring inflation down. And it does that by reducing demand, by shrinking its balance sheet, and also raising interest rates. So what we'd expect is that the Fed's policy will increase unemployment. It's just a question of by how much. Another timely indicator that we can look at, which looks forward one quarter, is something called a nowcast. So this is the GDP Now website, which is created by the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And what this does is look at the next quarter's GDP growth and monitor in real time how new data releases affect that growth estimate. So as each data point becomes available, you can see that the green line updates the forecast for Q2 GDP growth. And what you can see since the end of May is that that line's been wiggling downwards. And currently the estimate is at exactly zero for Q2. So certainly the data has been weakening in the US, but of course it would take two quarters at least in order to create a full recession. What does the Fed think? Well, this is the summary of economic projections as of June 2022 and their GDP expectations have actually been revised downwards. In March, they thought 2022 would have a growth rate of 2.8%, and they've revised that down by over 1%, down to 1.7%. So while that's not a very hard landing, it's certainly not a soft landing. In 2023, they're not really expecting much of a pickup at all. Only when we get to 2024 do we start to see growth slowly picking up. They've also revised upwards their unemployment expectations. So currently we're at 3.6 and now they expect at the end of 2022, we're going to be at 3.7, then 3.9 at the end of 2023 and 4.1 at the end of 2024. And Claudia Sam's actually said if that's true, it won't trigger her Sam rule. So that wouldn't trigger a US recession. But of course, the Fed would say this because it's their job not to crash the economy while getting inflation under control. And that's why it was interesting yesterday to see this new model being published by the Federal Reserve. Now, this is not an official model in any way. The Federal Reserve is always doing lots of research, publishing interesting papers. And this is one of those interesting papers. It's by Michael Kiley, and he looks at various models for predicting US GDP growth. Now, these are forecasting models, so they look some time into the future, in this case, four quarters, so that's a year into the future, to try and gauge the probability of a recession. Now, in fact, he comes at this indirectly. What he's actually forecasting is a spike in unemployment. But as we saw, that's a very good predictor of US recession. So this black line that you can see 
is his model's forecast, using four indicators, which we'll see in a second. But what really is quite shocking is that this probability has spiked recently above 50%. So the probability of a US recession, according to this model, over the next 12 months is greater than 50%. Now, that's upset some people because Fed guidance until recently was that they didn't expect a recession in 2022. We just saw the summary of economic projections. But the thing to remember is that this is not an official forecast. This is simply one of the pieces of research which the Fed publishes. That's not to say the model's not interesting, and we're going to dig into it in a minute, but it's not an official forecast. So this is not part of monetary policy guidance from the Federal Reserve. So what I'd say to Prof Plum 99 is simply to calm down. So I reproduced the model which the Fed has come up with. This is Kylie's macroeconomic indicators model. And these are the four factors that go into the model. There's CPI inflation year on year, the unemployment rate, which we saw is very important, credit spreads, which is how much risk is priced into the corporate bond market, and then finally term spread. So that's the slope of the US yield curve. When that inverts, usually you get a recession. So the blue line that you can see here is the output of that model. And the output is a probability of recession over the next 12 months. And the blue shaded bars are when the US recessions have actually occurred, according to the NBER committee. And you can see the model's pretty good. When this spikes above, say, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, it's very likely that you get a recession within a year. It's not an absolutely perfect model. So if we look, for example, at 1999, the probability spiked, but there wasn't a recession during the next year. However, in 2001, you can see the model spiked much higher. And sure enough, there was a recession. Then again, in 2016, it looked like there was a false positive. It really depends on where you threshold this probability. But this is what has everyone talking at the moment, which is that the probability has spiked up very rapidly recently. So according to my implementation of his model, that's well above 0.5%. So let's dig into the model and the four inputs to the model to see how they varied over time since 1960 and to look at how they relate to recessions in the past, which is the blue shaded regions. Now, the first input to the model, which is kind of counterintuitive, is the unemployment rate. The coefficient for that is actually negative. So when the unemployment rate is high, that's actually less likely to create a recession. Now, the reason for that, remember, is that unemployment increasing rapidly is what signals a US recession. So if the unemployment rate is already very high, then you're unlikely to spike much further. At least that's my understanding. So the unemployment being low at the moment is actually a worry for the model. So that factor currently gives a higher probability of recession. So that's a worrying thing right now. Now, the thing everyone's very aware of at the moment is inflation. That's pushing in the opposite direction. That's a negative factor. It's making a recession more likely because the model coefficient here is positive. So high inflation increases the probability of a recession. So unless inflation comes down, that's a worrying factor from the point of view of a recession. Now, as we've said, if we get an inversion of the yield curve, that's the third factor here, you can see that when it goes negative, often there's a recession that follows. For example, here in 1980, here in 2001. But certainly at the moment, that factor is actually not pointing at a US recession. There isn't a yield curve inversion at the moment based on the terms that this model considers. And another factor which isn't flashing red right now, but which is increasing, is US corporate credit spreads. So when credit spreads increase, the price of corporate bonds goes down and the cost of funding for US companies increases, and that increases the probability of default. It costs more to roll over debt, so zombie companies are more likely to go bust. And although that is increasing rapidly at the moment, which is worrying, compared to historic levels, it remains very low. Credit spreads still haven't even reached the points they were at during March of 2020, when we saw the last spike, and nowhere near where they were in 2008. So certainly that one is worrying because it's increasing, but it's at a level which isn't worrying, at least not yet. But that's certainly one to watch. 
If you want to get the latest update to the recession probability for the US from that Fed model, it's one of the tools we offer as a spreadsheet to PensionCraft members. You also get access to a growing library of video content, and you get access to Slack so you can ask questions about investing anytime you like. To learn more about that and get access to the spreadsheet, just click on the link beside me and in the description beneath me. How about recession in the UK? Almost any GDP graph that you look at for the developed world will look something like this, where there was a big fall in GDP, that's the level of GDP, during the recession while we had the pandemic and the lockdowns, then a very rapid recovery, which was a little bit patchy, and then we got back to where we started, or have overshot in some cases. What's worrying about the UK is that that's actually turned over recently, such that GDP is now below the level it was at in February of 2020. In fact, we've had two successive months where UK GDP has been negative. Now that's not a recession. In the UK, that's defined as two successive quarters of negative GDP growth. And if we look at this document from NISA, which is how likely is a major recession in 2022, they say that it's quite unlikely, at least not a sustained fall or a deep fall. They do say that there could be a small contraction of GDP in the second half of 2022, so it could be a technical recession, but they're really not expecting a deep recession. And if you look at the recession probabilities at the moment, they're pretty low as of the time of this forecast, and that was in May. Also in May, the Bank of England published the Monetary Policy Report in which it came up with this GDP projection for the UK. So again, you can see the fall in GDP, the bounce after the fall, but then what's happening is that it's gradually trending down to be centered around zero. These are called fan charts, and they simply represent that probability distribution, but unfortunately it's centered around zero. So the central case is no growth at all from the end of 2022 all the way through to 2025. So while we're not expecting a huge recession in the UK, it does look as if we're going to see almost no GDP growth for some period of time. That's certainly a weaker position than, say, the United States. In conclusion then, for the time being, the US is certainly not in a recession. Unemployment remains low, and the latest GDP number that we saw was firmly in positive territory. However, there are signs that it may be weakening for Q2 of 2022. Also, when we look at some models, certainly not all of them, it looks like there's a higher risk of recession in the next 12 months or two years. However, whenever we use these forecasting models, we have to realize that there are false positives. So that's certainly not set in stone. But the lesson from history is that if there is a recession, then risky assets, so that would be things like US equity, but also global equity, but also credit, so that's corporate bonds, and real estate investment trusts, for example, but also cryptocurrency, all of these risky assets would suffer to some degree. And if it's a deep recession, you'd probably want to head for safe havens. So as usual, that's cash, which isn't so great in a high inflation environment, but still okay. Gold would be another safe haven. And of course, government bonds, which may or may not provide a safe haven. So I think one of the most useful things about that model is it tells us which macro variables to focus on when we're thinking about recession. Unemployment's a key one. Is it spiking upwards? In which case, we're almost certain to get a recession. Inflation, will it stay high? Will the Fed get it under control? Will credit spreads continue to blow out? If so, that's a problem. And of course, yield curve inversion. That's usually a fairly good indicator of a recession ahead. Now, if you do want to get the latest probability of a US recession, you can do that with the spreadsheet, which is available to members. And to get our membership from our website, pensioncraft.com, just click on the link beside me and in the description beneath me. And as always, thank you for listening.